Good evening. I'm glad to see everybody here. This is a great crowd. That shows that you guys care about your community and what happens. Can you hear me a little bit or you can't? Okay, a little bit louder. I've never needed a mic before, so just point up. Okay, today we're having the meeting about the multi-event community center. And we have an architect here that uh, is from the Architects Rendering, and that's Carl Posiewicz. Yep. Yeah. And he will do the uh, little bit of a slideshow with, with the information slideshow. Uh, Wayne Stanley is our superintendent who's taken it upon himself to uh, do the endeavors of this community project. And then at the very end of this, we'll have a question and answer period, which I will moderate at that time. And I'll take one question at a time, and uh, then uh, Mr. Stanley, or our architect here, will go ahead and answer your questions. We'd like to do this in a very orderly fashion. And uh, at that time, right now, I guess I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Wayne Stanley, please. Thank you. Thank you. Carl Posewitz here will start us off. Let me just flip this to you, Carl. I'll get some lights off and you can explain a little bit more as we go. All right, uh, my name is Carl Posewitz. I'm with uh, Paradigm Architects uh, just down the road in Missoula. Uh, we've been working on this uh, idea for probably a couple years, I'm guessing. Um, and uh, this is kind of the status uh, that the design is at as of tonight. And I will uh, basically just roll the, the movie. We built a 3D digital model of the proposed design and um, placed it on, on the site so you can hopefully visualize uh, without too much work what uh, this project uh, would bring to town if it were to move ahead. So. I'll just hit the movie. I think everybody knows, you know, where it is. There's your track, and we're basically uh, just building it to the west of the existing school. This is the uh, upper level with the parking area, what you consider the front of the building. There's the proposed library on the left entrance, and then the right entrance is the, the main entrance. The movie at this point is kind of winding around across the front and it'll go along the north side here. The north, uh, pretty economical architecturally, not too much going on, just uh, you know, trying to enclose as much space as economically as possible. Uh, then if you, as the design flips around to the south here, this uh, is the side that uh, behind it are the swimming pools. Uh, there's three overhead doors that would roll up in the summer to make it kind of feel like an indoor-outdoor swimming pool. And in the winter time, they close down, so you have indoor uh, aquatics. <coughs> upper you can be louder. It will. Uh, upper level library on the left, weight room on the right, pools on the left, basketball on the right, um, aerobics room up above on the right. Now the uh, second floor will switch off, and we'll go to the lower level. Those are all the locker rooms on the left, community room on the right. Again, basketball is on the right, aquatics on the left, uh, wrestling room on the right, storage to the left of that, and then the racquetball court is in the upper right-hand corner. So pretty straightforward design, just those are the major components. Um, it's envisioned right now as being primarily built within a prefabricated metal building system for maximum economy. And then the roof just flipped back on. And then this is another view again of the part facing the track with the pool behind it. Libraries behind the gray portion there. And then once again, we're up top uh, to the front of the, of the uh, proposed community center. And that's, uh, that's the movie. Okay, next we have uh, Mr. Stanley, our school superintendent, please. 
uh, multi-event center, community center. Just a little bit brief history where we're at, where we came to. Um, the vision is to develop a facility that provides access to year-round affordable, accessible health, wellness, fitness, sports, social, recreational opportunities. Joining forces, working with our local agencies, um, working together with the city, the hospital, all endeavors to try and get together for one common goal is a better, superior. Uh, Project-wise, this started really four years ago with the vision of what we need. Uh, most people that know this building, the gym's 20 feet too short, it's 15 feet too narrow. Um, it's kind of a sore thumb for a lot of people that try and do anything within the system. And uh, we did some polling uh, about two and a half years ago at the fair. A lot of what came out of that were the needs of what the community felt was needed most um, within that adequate gym space, the pool in the community, the, the thought process there, if it's going down and it's in its last legs to look for the future of that. Um, economically to run a pool for two months out of the year at those costs don't feasibly work out. And uh, that's kind of where the, the thought process went. Timeline as far as where we're at today. Um, this is the second of three meetings. Next Wednesday we'll hold our third meeting. The ballots went out on January 8th. Um, the public has till the 28th to have those ballots in. They are counted on the 28th. So it is a, a timeline there that's uh, pretty set in stone to move forward with. Financial impacts of it. The project is being levied for a $7 million total. Looking at our 2011 taxes on the elementary, that was the last year that we did levy for it. Uh, this October, the elementary levy was paid off approximately three and a half years ahead of schedule. So it's been paid in full. We did not levy whatsoever for this year for the elementary. It was through refinancing of the elementary bonds. Um, the original elementary school cost $2.7 million is what the original bond was for. It was refinanced in about 2000, I believe it was, or 98, 2000, right in there, just off top of my head. But that second refinance was, was for $1.4 million. We paid that off ahead of schedule, so we did ultimately save the district and the taxpayers about four years worth of levy on the school. Previously, it was approximately $65 per $100,000 value on a home. This project, projecting at 3.75% interest is what the, the numbers were run at, is $157 per $100,000. That's approximately a $92, a $92 increase over the previous levy. Um, speaking about what happens with the, the interest rates right now, Bozeman just sold bonds on their elementary project at 2.62%. So they came in 1.1 below what we were looking at. Um, on their project, they're looking at a 20 some million dollar project building new schools. For us, it's almost a million dollar savings just at that 1% lower. You're looking about three million in interest on a $7 million loan. So just one percentage point lowers things that much. The grant options that are being explored, new market tax credit credits. Um, it's a system where with the new market tax credits, uh, investors basically are given a kickback on the incentives from the federal government. Um, just going through it, we would pay a 1% interest on that $2 million if we were to get it <coughs> over a seven year period and after that time, the seven million dollars is granted to you. So it's a low cost system. Those you apply for as soon as you get your priority funding in place. Um, loans, like I said before, just dropping a percentage point is a million dollars almost. So uh, if we were to go out and acquire zero percent interest loans, um, that actually saves a ton of dollars over a project's life. Three million on a seven million dollar project. Stevensville, two years ago, sold their bonds at their elementary project for zero percent. Um, a lot of that has to do with just with the government re 
issuing and the reinvesting in schools, things on that level, and that's where those dollars are coming from. Um, USDA community facility grants, those are areas that we'll look to apply for. Um, community block development grants. Uh, as far as other things, the quality zone academy bonds, those are low interest bonds that can be given to school districts. Um, one of the catches there, that would be more used for uh, pellet system, uh, changing out your heating system between the buildings. Uh, the, the QZAP loans are for existing structures being updated, not for constructing new ones. So uh, the biggest thing of all though is to get into the process of applying for most of those grants, you have to have funding in place. Um, no one's going to come out and say, we're gonna give you a million dollars but you got a year to spend it, and we hope you can raise the other six million in that time. They want to see funding in hand so that you can go forward with projects so that they can move forward with that. Um, our experience here when we did the lighting retro and the gymnasiums, it was quite interesting. That was Obama's first um, reinvestment in America Act that he came out with. Uh, if you go down to the high school, there's signage down there saying that it was uh, American Reinvestment Act. So they want to make sure that it's not just architects, engineers, but the sign companies, everybody had a part to play in that uh, system. So um, those dollars are being looked at upon again. Um, the goal is, is to try and buy down as much of the seven million as possible. If you can go in and get two, three, four million in loans at zero percent, you're reducing the cost. If you can get two million, three million in grants, your goal is to have that as low as possible so you're not levying the full seven million. But to come to the public, you have to know up front, worst case scenario, this could cost us seven million. It's not a, oh, I promise it'll only be this much. Can't make those promises. I feel very confident that the financing and the options are out there, but to stand before you, I'm not gonna risk my job saying that I guarantee you we'll get zero percent. No. Those are options that are out there and they will be just explored and, and really looked at. The basic concepts, the community center, community rooms were things that um, the public really wanted. There's no place specifically for social activities as far as family reunions, um, wedding dances, things on that level. Looking at this, if you looked at the far right at that community center, it's intended to have bifold doors that you can open up into the gymnasium. Going down to where it's the wrestling room, that's also a multi-use facility. Our goal is to redo our junior high into more of a community workforce center, more of a um, hands-on training facility for our own students. The, VOAG programs or your industrial arts programs, your, your programs on that level are what we really look to do. Um, what we'd look to do right now would be to take our multi-purpose room, which is the same as what our north end of our school is, where there's four classrooms, divide that into your four classrooms so that you now have a larger facility that you can expand your VOAG, or not your VOAG, but your industrial arts program. Um, look to do more of your hands-on activities with those students. Statistically speaking, 80% of our kids will not go to college past their first year. 40 out of 100 will go for a year. Of that 40, only 20 will go back their second year. So um, to have those hands-on activities, um, more of the vocational training and electives, that's where our workforce is going, and we need to look towards the future with that. So. The 4-H building is needing repair. Um, by opening that up, you can also use it with the 4-H, hopefully more accessible-wise, having more area for the, the kids within those programs. This week's a pretty good week to talk about an indoor walking track. Um, I think most of us have skated a little bit and did our breakdance moves and things like that, but it's... Uh, it's definitely a thing for the public to come in and have access 24 hours a day to walk. Uh, system itself would be designed with surveillance cameras, um, giving access just with um, basically a punch key type system where you can have access and come in and work out at your own time and place as far as the walking track and things like that. So 
swimming pool has to be manned because it's a public pool. It has to have lifeguards on duty. It's not something that you can just say, here, go swim, don't drown. It, it's not a hotel facility. It is a public facility and it has to be manned. So those hours, you'd look at the program. Um, when we did the business program and working with uh, USA Swimming, uh, let me jump to here first. The programming options, you know, it's really limited to your own imagination from yoga to archery, funerals are in the school system. Um, I, I think we've held about everything in this gym that you can possibly hold at a certain level. Um, the health fair that the clinic puts on and the hospital puts on is done here and, you know, they've outgrown this building actually. They, they need more room and space. And, um, but from weddings to just about anything you can imagine could take place in it. Um, from Toastmasters to Knuckle Club, all those things that make us young and vibrant again, those are all activities that can come within the play of a facility like that. Uh, the makeup is an indoor pool, waiting pool, therapy pool. That's kind of the one end of it where it looks like there's a big loop in it. Um, what we're proposing is the concept of it. You know, if this were to pass, I'm 99% sure it's not going to look the same. It's going to have the same amenities, but the pools until you hire a specific pool architect that's going to say this is how you want it, this is what's laid out, feasibility, financially, these are the things you have in place. Um, Carl's good at his job, but he's not a pool architect, and you know, they ultimately tell him everything outside of the foot of that pool, all this, or inside of that foot of the pool, all designed, you get the outside of it. But, um, two community rooms, the weight, or the wrestling room itself would be um, basically from November to the end of March is when our wrestling season runs here in Superior, but having the availability to roll those mats up and um, hold more than one function at one time, whether it's training for our forest service, which takes place currently now, or you know, even just a place to meet for your Saturday morning book club, things on that level. It does have a uh, community school library. It's intended to um, have the library facilities up within it so that it does open up the options. Um, from the school standpoint, we save about 3500 to 4000 a year just on library software by combining our libraries. Um, we have one librarian that's a full-time librarian. Um, having that in that place would help ease that. It does have a racquetball court, 180 yard walking track, uh, weight room, and the aerobics facility or areas. The heating, lighting, operational costs are projected at 60,000 a year. Pool chemicals are your basic 10,000 a year. Operation maintenance at 50,000 a year. What this is looking at is based on four hours of open swimming a day is what you're looking at. You know, roughly 28 to 30 hours is how your plan is looked at. What that is entailing is looking at it from the perspective of your morning, if you've got water aerobics and open swim from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., that's going to be manned by someone within our adult ed program. We've had a dozen people just in the planning stages come up and say, well, I'd do that. I would love to do that. Um, you know, what I'm looking at is your four hours a day is basically from 5 to 9 at night, um, that time of the day, because it has to be manned by a lifeguard. Um, everybody wants in the pool after school, before school. Um, when we look at the other side of it, the, the revenue side of it, that's where that eight in the afternoon, or in the morning till four in the afternoon really comes into play. Um, city spends approximately 40,000 a year on upkeep for their pool outside of their other costs. Um, therapy rental, what that is, it's not telling me that the hospital is giving me a check for $50,000 a year. Your therapy time rental comes from your doctors and therapists prescribing therapy for those people. Working with USA Swimming, you know, their projections are a, a town of our size, minimally 50,000 a year. You know, if you're a town of 5,000 as Colson, they're looking at 125,000 a year based on that time. 
And when you start adding things up, if you have one hip that has to be worked on, if you break your hip falling and you have to go through the recovery process, doing it here in Superior versus back in Fort Missoula easily pays for your $150 a year increase in taxes. You know, those things, if you look at it from worst case scenario, if I have to go through a rehab system, it's going to save. User fees, the intended user fees are strictly the pool area because that is a high cost area. That's where your user fees are intended. Um, based on communities, I came from Stanley, North Dakota, they've got one attached to their hospital nursing home. Their usage, a town of a thousand, this was five years ago before the oil boom was really big there, they were averaging 4,500 people a month in the pool. And that starts at 6 a.m. with water aerobics, 7 a.m. water aerobics. And if they had people available to teach at 8 and 9, they would have. But the buy-in comes from the people. Um, the more you use it, the more it comes around. You know, as we go to our questions, is now the time to invest in our community? You know, that's something you have to decide is now something that you want to decide as far as the outcome of our community, is this where we look to invest in? Um, the school district is the financial tool that would build the center. The school district would own it, but we have to work in partnerships with the city. We have to work with other groups from the Forest Service when they come in in the summers. Um, common sense tells me to be able to have an air-conditioned facility for our fire crews to stay in in July and August would be an awesome thing for them. But they also have training needs that they already use our facilities for. The biggest avenue I think as a school district is that the design itself lends itself to the public. Our kids would come in for Phi Ed class. Our kids would have access to swimming lessons. But we're looking about two periods a day. You're not going to open up the pool all day long for kids to jump in and out periodically. You're going to strategically plan it. This period, we've got this class. This period, we've got elementary. We've got advanced phi ed classes, things like that. Does it expand our curriculum? Yes, it does. Does it add to what we can do? It does. Educationally, it expands what we can do in the vocational areas. We no, lo we no longer have a home ec class. Part of that is we couldn't hire a teacher any longer. But it's also a change in the philosophy. Vocationally, we need to look to the future. You know, with 80% of our kids not going to college, we have to prepare them to work in the workforce, whether that's welding classes, mechanics, computer classes, just so they know how to fill out a job application. Those are all things and avenues as a school we have to prepare our kids for. If our kids are ready for college, they're ready for the workforce. It's our goal to have them ready for college. But I want them beyond ready for college. I want them ready for the workforce, too. And not all kids that go to college that first year, I'll tell you, aren't ready for the workforce. If plans move forward, when would the facility open? Ultimately, and this is why the vote takes place in January, um, we need to give the architects, the engineers, time to design it, to get the final plan so that you can go out to a bid process to bid it at the earliest I would imagine would be a July 1st to break ground. That saves about half your construction costs if you're not trying to vote in May, break ground in November, and heat cement and try and enclose a building over the winter months. It just, common sense tells you you've got to do it in the summer if you're going to do it at all, just to save that money. Um, realistically, you're looking at 10 to 12 month construction time. So the spring of 2014. Big question prior to usage, various components of the facility. <coughs> the vision we've had all along in the committees is that the school board is not here to run this facility as a community center. Um, if you've got buy-in from the city, from the hospital, from different places within it, you need to have a community-run group. Uh, almost a board that comes in and says, these are our priorities wise. It's not a case that, oh, geez, we misscheduled something and we got a sixth, seventh grade basketball game that's gonna take precedent over your 
Ducks Unlimited Banquet or Mule Deer Foundation Banquet. We've got to get those kids in there first. No, it has to be done. Um, Scheduling-wise, it's pretty simple to lay things out and do that, but you also want an impartial group to turn around and do that. One of the questions that always comes up, as a school facility, guns, alcohol, those things, how can you do it? It really comes down to the board setting their policies, allowing those things to take place. Right now, we can bring firearms into our schools, generally for the purpose of education, such as hunter education, things on that level, demonstrations. Um, we've had a lot of World War I and World War II demonstrations take place with firearms. Our uh, Legion comes in and they do flag presentations and all those things, and Doug can attest to that. They're always allowed in with their weapons. Um, but that's all through the policies of the school the district has. Alcohol in the school system can be allowed, but it's done through the right procedures. You know, to do it, you want to have it in place that if it's Aaron LaPierre, he's bringing his liquor license and his insurance in place to operate that function transfer that license. I think it's in Superior we do a cabaret license, something on that. But you have to have somebody that's in the business of doing it. You sell alcohol, you have to be trained to do it. And uh, there's no one in this room that's going to say, I'm going to have a barn dance and give away free beer all night long and hope I don't get sued. Because somebody's going to wreck a car and somebody's going to be owning your farm and your barn and everything else. So. Those things really just come down to the, the school district, setting those policies and letting that committee run them. Um, you know, you want to have the city take part in it. You want the, whether it's a clinic or one of the, the PAs, someone on that, um, they need to maintain it. You want to be able to use it for the, the betterment of your community. How does this change or what was this, would this do to Superior? You know, ultimately it's can we afford to build it? And that's the biggest question that people have. Can we afford to build it? Um, my personal opinion, outlook, I'm not a business owner. I'm a school teacher, I'm a superintendent. I don't have the extra cash to turn around and say, you know, I want to open up a subway in town. I don't have the time or energy to run that as well. How can I invest in my community? This to me is an investment in my community. By spreading it out throughout the school district, it's less than what the city would have to do themselves. If the city were to do just the pool, you know, you're talking a million and a half to two million dollars to replace that pool on just the smaller city area, that's going to be an unattainable idea. You're really going to tax those people within that area. Ultimately, can we, as a city, afford not to build it? As I look down the highway, what separates Superior from St. Regis, from Alberton, from Drummond, anywhere along the highway? It's the people of the community, do you want to invest in yourselves? The health and wellness of our community is priority one. How long do we want to live? Nobody has an end date in mind, do you? You know, we all want to live forever, but we also want to do it in a, a healthy way. Um, I don't want to become a grumpy old man. I do want to live a prosperous life, but uh, you know, for me, I, I look upon it, if my taxes go up $350 a year on the property I own, over a 20 year period, if I invest $7,000 in my house, in my community, will I get that back in 20 years if I look to move? I believe I will. If I do nothing, what's gonna happen? Um, today's workforce looks for avenues. You know, it's, a, it's an argument of the chicken or the egg. Can we bring jobs to town first and then build this? Well, we need something to attract jobs just as we need other avenues, you know. Why does somebody want to bring a company here to create a business? Or do we want to create things that attract businesses to our community? Um, is it progressive thinking? Yes, it is. I think, you know, looking back, we're not doing things in education the way we did 50 years ago when the high school was built. We're not doing things in the business world the way we did 50 years ago. Just from a simple computer to, you know, the phone in your pocket to now do everything that your laptop can do. Things are changing fast. Nobody rode their horse to the meeting tonight. And, you know, we, we got to look to the progress of the, the community. And 
ultimately, that's where I think a lot of the thinking came from. Um, is it too big? Is it too much? Is it too big? Those are all the questions we've been through as a committee. This started out huge, and Carl can attest to this, and those that started in the process to begin with. We've tried to reduce, reduce, reduce to be as small as possible. So that it is something that's not a Taj Mahal. It, it's meant to be something for the public. Um, as a community member, your, your ability to have 24-7 access to the walking track, to the weight room, to those areas, to me, that's a plus. Um, do you need somebody to babysit people walking around? No. I don't think you need a babysitter per se. You need somebody that can monitor and see that things are going well. And uh, we have faith in our kids and our community to use the facilities we have. I think we have to have faith in our citizens to be able to come out and use it wisely and, and without abusing it. But that takes us through the main presentation. I know there's a lot of questions. Gordon, if you want to start leading us down that road. Okay, here's how we're going to work this out. We've got about an hour to do this, and I'd like to make sure everybody gets home on time. Uh, so 8.30 is what the magic mark we're trying to do. There's a lot of people here and a lot of questions that need to be answered. So I would appreciate if one person at a time would ask a question and make your question short and sweet to the point so we don't linger on the, uh, the question for length of time where nobody else gets their, their questions asked. So I'll take the first question at this time. Yes, ma'am. I just want to know, what, how did you come up with the $7 million Have you not seen any you know, contract or figures or building material or anything? How did you come up with that one kind of We worked with Jackson contracting. How was the $7 million come up with? Um, we worked with Jackson just on cost estimating. And that's their part in it. They've just done it. Um, it's been of no cost to the school district. They have gone through and projected out the cost. Um, working with Carl, what would a heating system run? Things on that level. We've done through all the projecting of what it is. Um, you know, our figures range from 6.98 million to 7.4 million. And you know, when the, the board went to it and said, this is our cap, this is where we're going. We're not going for a $10 million structure. Seven million dollars is where the cap is. Um, ultimately, the process would go that bids would go out if this were passed. And if they came in, back in at eight million, then we start cutting things down. If they come in at seven million, okay, can we affordably do this? Is this within the realm of it? You can't go over seven million. No, this okay. is the very max. Okay, next question, George. Please stand up. I really don't have a question. I got comments. Thank you. 
Take it on. Do we need it? No. Why is it your business? That's Can I finish my well, statement? Get question. Yeah. As a school district, can we operate without this facility? Yes. As a community, can we survive without this facility? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Not really yes. The things you're going to tax me on the house. Yeah, I have a question back there, and then I'll take your question. Sir. I think it's always smart to listen to someone that doesn't have a vested interest in uh, a proposal um, and it's only for the betterment of the community. I have two children. I have a lot of property in this community and I'm subject myself potentially to a, a significant uh, tax increase um, which is difficult for anyone to swallow. Um, my, my family's been in this community for at least three generations. I've seen businesses come and go and a lot of losses of businesses, um, but I don't think that anybody can dispute the fact of what you put into your children and what you offer them uh, pays off benefits. Um, I guess one, my one main question I have that comes out of this that concerns me the most as a business owner is what projections have went into just the operation of it? because. As a business owner, I can tell you my experience is building it's the easy part. It's the maintenance and operation um, and overview of it that, that concerns me because um, <coughs> what I like to see, I think that everything that I've seen on here uh, was something that I got to grow up with. I got to grow up with a swimming pool um, at the time. The school was big enough. I had a wrestling room, a multi-purpose room. Um, and I see the need for the improvement in our community. Does it bring new jobs? I don't know. It's a two-edged sword like you've said. Um, it's definitely not a downside to uh, raising your kids and giving them an opportunity that I think they deserve. And so I guess my one question is what's the thought process that's gone into um, the future outlay of the operation cost that we're looking at and is that something that you anticipate we're going to have to 
see another uh, a levy or some type of um, uh, con contribution from the community to pay for that? Or is this seven million um, just, and, and is that just simply the building cost and then there's that extra afterwards? To answer your question, uh, projections are coming from um, Tempright, I believe is our mechanical, electrical that went through the simulation uh, working with Carl as far as everything down to how many doors, windows, um, the electrical engineers as well to get that operating cost. Their projections are 60200 uh, to heat and air condition the facility. A lot of that technology you're going to uh, recover a lot of your heat because of the air exchange and the pool, things on that level. The operating costs as far as the pool, those numbers and figures, those come from uh, Nick Nelson with USA Swimming. He's been in the business of operating personal pools in private areas, uh, private health spas down south, different things like that. Um, you know, going with that, it's strictly, you know, working with their numbers as far as uh, projections for community use, things on that level. Those are the the real numbers that you're dealing with um, through his 30 plus years in business. Um, I feel very confident in those numbers, um, having attended those, worked with the uh, community up in Polson, uh, people that are putting together their indoor pool. You know, a lot of their business plan and modeling is based on those same numbers. You know, theirs is based on a larger community, of course, but um, you know, it, it's per capita, these numbers and, and things like that. The biggest hurdle that I see isn't so much um, getting people to come, it's having your doctors and PAs starting prescribing those things. Um, the more they prescribe them, the more it gets used, and that's just through my own experiences back in North Dakota. Um, until the doctors bought into the fact that working out in a pool was less stress on the body, those were, were the times that the facility itself picked up. Thank you. Question. Yeah, you know, last week uh, I asked a question about vocational training, and it was kind of like pushed under the table. Just somebody, I think Mr. Stanley said, "Well, we do have night classes and everything else." Now this week there's a lot mentioned about vocational training. Well, everybody was for, and the crowd was for the vocational training last week and he didn't mention much about the vocational training okay i look at it like this okay they need three or four thousand welders in Williston right now to build that pipeline from montana to texas okay why can't we take seven million dollars or three million dollars or something like that invested in our kids in vocational training we need, we need auto mechanics. We, everybody doesn't need a computer in front of their face now. They need to start working with their hands. This is a world that we're going to be living in. All we have to do is have the electricity go off once. There's not one person that can change the tire. And so we, your question is? Why, why, is, why is there so much talk about vocational training tonight? And last week there was nothing. Are, are you trying to please us? make us feel good because uh, last week there was nothing about it. Now this week all of a sudden now, now we're talking we're going to have vocational training this week. Last was, week there was nothing. What was talked about was a lot of the adult education. If I'm interpreting last week, we could do these other things outside the scope of it. Within our school day, we have a vocational teacher. He teaches five periods a day vocational as far as wood, welding, on things on that level. But we're limited to their abilities. You know, if he's not a grade A1 mechanic, you know, it, it doesn't fit within the scheduling to put somebody in the classroom where the kids are teaching the teacher how to do mechanics. I couldn't go in and teach mechanics. I couldn't go in and teach small engine repair. So you have to have the right people in place as well. well why don't we look at this for the future? 
if I can answer that. Okay, if, if I can answer that question. If, if you uh, sometimes get a chance, go over to watch Mr. Schultz work in his welding class. We have two welding classes there, and I work with them on occasion. And these kids are doing phenomenal. He's building a future for these kids. And these kids uh, have shown uh, uh, the is unbelievable. As a matter of fact, there are a couple of them that try and get on the railroad as soon as they graduate with their welding ability. And other ones are going to probably take <coughs> them go to North Dakota where it's being made. And so we are producing as much as we can with the money that we have and the ability that we have. I, I, I give my attaboys to uh, our school system for the education that we are providing at this time and with that welding class. I'll tell you what, Mr. Schultz, if you see him working with those kids, it's a miracle with it. So take a chance to go in there and see what we're providing already. Why is this money being focused on that instead of the swimming pool? Mr. Stanley. Last question in your part on how I have another question over here, please. Good, we got ice in my mouth. Oh, <laughs> got you off guard. <laughs> Yeah, we would go to the public if we're going to expand that. Um, to do that project, if you're going to rebuild the shop and increase that, you're going to have to lose your program for at least a year to do that. I mean, ultimately, if you're going to rebuild that shop, there's a point in time you're going to have to tear down the old building. <coughs> Land is probably the most limited thing we have here. We could expand it into this area crap and still keep it there, but then you're going to tear that building down or decommission that at some point in time if you're going to save anything within the, the structure of it. You know, as a group, are you going to spend three and a half million on a structure? I don't know. If it's just for vocational programming, that would be a choice that the public would come to. As a board and district, we looked at this as what's best for the community. Okay, question over here, Mr. Sinclair. Yeah, I'm outside your school district, so I'm still in this community, and my question, I guess, I'm still invited to come into your facility yep. as a payee, correct? Yep. And so the quickest sell all this, everybody has great questions and great concerns, and the easiest way to solve all this, and you can tell us, and tell your people, is you've got a great design, there's some good, some good things there, and you've got all the operational costs, you've got the cost of this project. What's the, what's the generation of revenue? Our projection is to yes, but I think throughout the, the process that we've been through, through our committee meetings and that, your ultimate goal is to try and keep it as affordable as possible. Um, you know, is it a dollar a day you charge women? Is, is that the case? Um, you know, if you're projecting 120,000 a year, for operation and 150 for revenue, yes, you're 30,000 is good. But I think as a group, that operating board is going to say, we need to keep that as minimal as possible, those fees. Can we keep it? Can you build a small nest egg so if you have a pump go down that you know you've always got those things covered? That's your business plan. You want to have a bumper zone. Um, you know, everybody knows you can lead a horse to walk. Can you make them drink the water? No. I, I, I can't stand before you and say, I guarantee you 100% of our population is going to use the facility. But I know just through experience in, in small towns, the more people get in, inundated to a pool system that's indoors and operational throughout the year, it does get used. Well, you know, if you involved in projects like this, the biggest thing to do
percentage of our yearly budget right now that goes towards maintenance, um, approximately 82% of our budget goes right now to salaries. So we operate and maintain our, our facilities as is with 18% of our budget is where we're at right now in the school system. Ron, uh, question? I just Could you please stand up so we can hear? They get in forty-five thousand in user fees and nineteen thousand from the school, which is about twenty-seven percent of the expenditures. That's where my concern is. Building the building, like Lance says, is really easy. It's running it the rest of the time, and you keep coming back to the community for those levies. And you know, you put the numbers up there; they're budgeted numbers. There's no guarantees on those numbers that are coming exactly. in either, and that's. I think everybody should be aware of that. Right. Okay. Uh, so first, uh, Ron, it was first. Um, I just had a quick question regarding, you know, the property tax increase, which I'm concerned enough about. But then are the property tax users going to be having to pay the same user fees as people that don't pay the property taxes? I'd say that's my probably my biggest concern because I'm looking at my property taxes increasing 60 bucks a month and then am I going to have to pay another you know, and that's probably um, the most I want to pay already. <laughs> and I have four kids, so I'm like, I can see the huge benefits in having something like this, but um, that's my question. I, I think, Gordon, what he's alluding to, we do at the city. Um, I, I think it's different than what uh, her question is more. You have a population that comes at lives in low income housing or whatever the case that don't pay property taxes, whether it's your rent or things like that. Um, what's that? Right, yeah. Outside the district, they're going to pay a larger fee than inside the district. Yeah. Is she going to pay the same as what? taxes, will she also have to pay for another uh, a fee to get into the pool? I'm trying to ultimately decide, like, how much is this going to cost right. me to use? Yes. Am I going to be the pool area is the only area that we've ever really discussed a user fee on, whether it's a dollar a day or whatever those things are, just basing it on the numbers of usages. And that's where that projection of X amount a year through usage, whether it's so 50000 a year. Okay, if I can answer that real quick. Uh, in the city right now, you all pay taxes for the city pool, and yet you also pay to get into the pool. It's the same, it's not any different, but there is a difference when you're outside of the city limits, then you will pay an adjusted fee, which is larger, and that's when we have our seasonal passes. And work that out. That's so our, so our taxes, we pay for the pool. Yes. We live out of town, so we pay the out of town rate. Yeah, you, so you we don't, don't pay the You don't pay the taxes for the pool. No. no, you don't. Just in the city itself, and that would be just in the school district itself, is the people that would be paying the taxes on this levy, if I'm yeah. correct on that. And then anybody outside the school area would be paying the adjusted fee for, then, uh, for usage of the pool, if, if I stand yeah. for it. Okay. Right, I have one more question that was up there, please. Is it, anybody looking into the YMCA reach-out program? Do you need funding in this? Or is that 
organizations good idea. Why Within that, Sean, it's the YMCA reach out. My understanding and my visits with those involved with those, it's a grant matching situation, so there are funds out there as well. Um, most of the, the smaller grants, and I'm talking $50,000 grants, are for operations, for a lot of the programming things that are out there. And those are a lot of the ones that, um, if you build this, the job as superintendent or whoever, you know, for writing grants, it doesn't end after the bill is paid for. You know, you're really going to look to, to try and bring things in from Coca-Cola to all those other avenues that are out there. You know, there, there's a, a ton of things out on the web and everywhere else for funding grants and things like that, but having the facility in place to have a program you can run is really where it comes to. Right, and then uh, I work with the guy, who might work with the Y, and they, they love situations just like we have right now. They saw in the news in Missoula and were asking questions and the why really want to help. They're, they're an organization that is all about families, not just kids, not just the elderly, families, and to help everybody. And if we can find groups like that that can help take care of this, that's huge. Washington Corporation is huge on donating money. I grew up with taking those kids. I know he, he's a big hearted person and stuff like that that we can reach into the world. Okay. Rana? Consolidated, like the the county library and the, and the school library, is there any uh, is there any hands being tied by grants or jobs or restrictions that would prevent that? Because that would be a good merger. I think you were talking about upgrades every year. The libraries have to upgrade. There's an expense in that. But you know, if you consolidated the county and the school one, is that possible? Has that been looked into legally? Yes, we have discussed it with the county library board. There's They're no currently operating. St. Regis with the school district okay. and they're working with Alberton now to go together. The cost savings if you combine things together um, from the school standpoint just combining our own elementary library, it's about $3,500 to $4,000 in just software fees a year because we're two separate buildings you're saving some money there. Of the two library positions and then also you've got the county librarian position. We have only one librarian here it's okay. one full-time library, okay. so those are the cost <coughs> savings the city on. library? City library operates approximately 28 hours a week. Um, ours is roughly from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. You know, so is it an expansion? Is that what would go on? I think that's ultimately what you would have to look at, or the county that, that operates at that library board if they were to come together. Can we expand those hours, or do we take them? You know, if, if together you're at close to 70 hours a week, does that expand? I know the numbers for the library, I was at their board meeting, uh, I think, a month ago, and they were at uh, 2,800 users a month. I mean, it's pretty incredible how many do come into our local library. Okay, next question, sir. Yeah, I have a question based on the community. It's been a long time about these grants. And so I guess my question is, if this passes for seven million and you get no grant, does this budget? That's what we're voting. Is that case scenario? This is the cost of it, and it will move forward for the moment. That is what we're voting on. You're voting approval up to seven million to build the structure without grants. And it has to be sold to the public that way. Yeah, you can't come to the, the public way. saying, vote for seven million, but I promise you it's only going to be five million or it's only going to be four million. You have to know, worst case scenario, this is what the costs are. 
This is where it's at. If nothing else is funded throughout it. Bruce Berry. So the taxes will be adjusted according to the number of grants or the tax burdens going to be the same? If you were to get, say, two million in grants, just as a ballpark, that what the board goes out and sells bonds on, they're not going to sell bonds on seven million with a two million dollar grant. You know, at that point, you're going to lower that. Just as when the interest rates here at the elementary, when they are better to decrease and resell the bonds, we saved four years of time on the building and the payments went down because the board financially went out and lowered the bonds. And they've got that ability to. They don't have to sell today. If you pass it today, they're not gonna say, oh, we need to sell $7 million in bonds to start the project. You know. As grants come in, you're going to look to offset that and decrease it. As an example, if you were to get a $200,000 grant, just a $200,000 grant, do you levy this year that additional $200,000 or do you just budget within that, decrease that $200,000 off what's taxed that year? You know, each year we go out and we ask for a dollar a month. And then the county transfers that into a mill a month. And that's where everybody going, okay, how's this work? But you know, it's still a case there that the, you go out and if you can decrease those by those dollar amounts, you're not going to tax the public for that. You're going to try and decrease it and operate it within those means. Okay, just small back, she is. It is the taxable value of Superior School District. And how many mills will this require? Top of my head, I'm thinking we're 4,600,000. I'm just, on top of my head, I don't. And how many mills? How many mills? This is approximately 107 mills. Um, previous building was about 42 mills. The elementary is what the elementary bond is. And that's projecting at a three and three quarter percent interest rate. As those fluctuate up and down the lower interest rate, and ultimately you can save, like I said, there's $3 million worth of interest projected into it at three and three quarter percent. Mr. Goins? It's not anything more than a convenience issue if they would choose to come in with us. That's where, the, if the library, it, it's their choice. It's not, this project is not passing and failing based on whether our county library wants to come in with the school district. <coughs> Town has not committed their full funds, no. We haven't went to them saying, this is exactly what we would like to do. Until this is passed, are they going to commit to this ahead of time? No. I have visited with the commissioners. Angelo's here. He knows and understands until it's something that the community has said, yes, we want this. As a community, I believe the community of Superior is larger than the city of Superior. Okay, now to be fair, I want to make sure that everybody gets a question asked and I'm right now picking all the ones that haven't asked a question. I'll get back to you and you, George, for the questions you will have, but uh, right now, right now. Someone asked earlier about the um, expenses and the costs and you mentioned the furnace and the $60,000 a year for the furnace and all that kind of a thing, but I'm sure that there's a lot more expenses. There's just from our own home budgeting water, sewer, garbage, all those kinds of things. Plus, there's a host of other stuff that comes into to play than just the furnace. Now, you might be getting a good deal on just a good, efficient furnace and the pellet stoves or different things right. for things like that. But the community has been, their water rates in town has gone up so high that they're not even able to water their grasses. And right. So it's dying. And, we live out of town, we have a well, so we don't experience that. But, so there's a lot more expenses to this than really 
we can all even imagine. Within the modeling, we have looked at all of those expenses. It does come into play with all those things. Um, the projections and things like that are full encompassing. It's not just heating and lighting. It's all encompassing of what your operational expenses are per year. Mr. Stanley, I have a question for you real quick. Uh, FTEs, how many? 29 full-time teachers. Okay, uh, will you, after this building is put up, if it is put up, how many FTEs will there be? 29 full-time teachers. It's really dependent. Um, you know, what we look towards the future is, you know, we're down to single sections for the most part. Um, we know right now, projecting ahead, uh, we've got a preschool of 33 to 35 kids, and one person cannot handle 33 kindergarten years. It's almost impossible. It's also, too, I was thinking about this. I was at the meeting on Monday. I was thinking about this also. Not just are we going to have to have lifeguards, but we're going to have to have someone that's supervising in the gym so that there are <coughs> bullies and people having created chaos so that it's a friendly environment for all of our community children to be there in a safe place. So there's a lot of things. Yeah, those things have all been looked upon. Um, the operation, the maintenance, those are the things where you're looking. Having a person that is uh, not just custodial, but you do have to check the pool and the chemicals, things like that. You know, you're operating those things. Those are all looked at with it. Okay, anybody who hasn't asked a question yet that, uh, uh, yes, please. Okay, are Stand up. Are we going to be able to hire someone who's security? Because no really we're all about security in schools and stuff like that. Security. A lot of the programming that's in place right now, and Scott can attest to this probably better than anybody. Um, right now, our school does not operate from 8:30 to 3:30. We've got kids as early as seven in the morning getting dropped off. Some days, uh, most days at the elementary, they're out here about five o'clock at the the latest. Um, you know, Darren had kids here, and there's people coming and going, but. Um, we do before school to some extent as far as trying to give them a warm, safe place to stay. After school, we program until 5 o'clock. Your goal is to continue that after school program. A facility like this expands what we can do. And by that expansion, it's really before school, after school, it's expanded into the summer months. Um, right now, we currently offer a summer hot lunch program to anybody 1 to 18 years old, it's free of charge, through the state. Um, they did a breakfast program two years ago, numbers weren't high enough. Uh, from the school standpoint, we do some summer reading programs, some after school programming in the summer to bring kids in. Um, the biggest hook that we could ever have educationally is to have a swimming pool where we can say, okay, you got lessons from 10 to 11. You've got a reading class from 11 to 12. you got lunch at noon. After that, you've got open swim. You know, those, those are the things we look at educationally. How does this improve us? Astronomically, it moves us farther ahead because um, the numbers of kids that drop and decline educationally over the summer is pretty high. Um, generally speaking, the first month back in school is catch up trying to get them back to where they ended the year before. You know, those are our ultimate selfish goals is that we'll be able to work with kids for a longer period of time. Nobody wants to go to school in the summer, whether they need to or not. The library does offer some summer reading programs and they're very low attended. But if you've got a hook such as a swimming pool or things like that, I know educationally that's going to be a great thing to bring those kids in. And then we artistically program their lessons and their swimming time around the other things that can be done. Scott, can you reiterate, talk on that a little bit? Well, I think that's one of the things that we talked about in the back in the offering program is long throughout the day during the school year, but also a summer program that would be inclusive of breakfast and lunch, would also be inclusive of programming 
And we do offer lots of summer programming. But that opportunity to have kids already here, not for the reason that you have to go to school and learn how to read some more, but the fact that you're here to go get some lessons. And while you're here, how about we get you a reading rainbow? Or we're doing digging for dinos or all the different programs that we offer in the summer. So we can uh, capture more of those kids and their interests uh, summer long. Educationally, our kids will benefit exponentially. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair? I don't think that answered her question. She yeah. wanted to know what are you going to do about security? Security? Are you going to have a full time police officer patrolling the facility? No. Do you have to have it? What I was concerned about, we're close to the freeway. Yep. Okay, we have this facility that kids and our community people go to work. Okay? They can come in there. <laughs> Anybody could. So I'm wondering if we're going to have to hire someone to kind of help make it a safe place for all of us, not just the kids, right. but for everybody. Even the library that you show has an exterior door. Uh -huh. You know, most school libraries are within this, the building, not having an exterior door like as if it's going to be a public place. Who's going to keep people from coming in? Is there going to be a monitor at that door to keep people? Because I'm sure that I, I see a lot of people here that I have not seen before, and I'm sure I, you might not know who I am. So, I mean, we can assume that they're from our community, but we don't know. And here's this public, this, this school library, combining the elementary and the high school with an exterior door like the public can come in and enter. What's with that? And also, this public area where the different uh, things, who's going to monitor that? Because there's also access that gets into the school building. Okay. Yeah, I got a question related to that. How are you going to provide 24-hour access to people who are going to use their walking track? Right now, as an example, Choices has a 24-hour access. They're monitoring within their own video surveillance systems. And can we be there all the time? No. You can't have somebody in place 24 hours a day that's going to be there to see the Technology-wise, yes, you can provide the video surveillance, and if some things are damaged, you have the ability to go back in and track this down and really get those. Um, ultimately, do you use technology to your advantage? Yes, you have to. But you also have to use it to control those that can't be trusted. If somebody abuses that right, you still have to offer them a chance to prove they can do it. It's within the, the confines of what we do in the school systems. We believe kids are good. And when they prove us wrong, then we got to start restricting what they do. And we believe adults are good. Okay? The shootings out in Newtown, Connecticut, can we ever prepare as a community for something like that? This is a school, not a jail. And until we make it a jail, I'm not going to be able to keep people out. You know, those are the things we live with and we, we talk about as a staff. We go through these things time and time again. You know, within our own city, what's the guarantee that, you know, those that have been down to the park in the summertime, it's nothing to see needles, used condoms, these things popping up on the park benches down there. Drug sales, all those things are going on. How do we control those things? We have to instill in our, our police force. You know, maybe we get creative at certain times that the county buys into the fact that let's get our officers in there walking and exercising and helping monitor throughout the time. But you don't have that in a plan. I guess no, we're no, we don't. Kind of security no. that you're not telling us there's any security at all. It has to get worked out with that operational board. But you're okay. asking us right now to have faith and trust and pay seven million right. on a system and a situation right. that. I ultimately can't think of everything that's going to go on in that. The committees that have worked on it, Christy has been there. We try not to get down to the minute details, such as, well, we have to have an air dryer to dry our swimming suits. Well, that, that has to get worked out. I mean, these are things that you just can't. There's a million things everybody has. Oh, what about this? What about this? We can't do that. We are trying to do the best to present something. The concept is what you're looking at. The idea, is this something for Superior Montana? Yes or no? You get to choose just like I get to choose. 
If my ballot says yes, I want this, that's the one vote I get. Mrs. Coburn. Ultimately, we need more space. We need more space for our kids. And by that, it's not just the simple first grade classroom needs a bigger classroom. Um, when you start bringing in speech and LD services and counseling services, all those places need space. And that's ultimately where Today's buildings aren't large enough any longer. You're, you're putting people in old closets and you're revamping and shifting people around and you need to give them ample space to work with kids too. So the library office would be expanding? You, you could, exactly that. If the county library, city library came together at the school, you'd look, can we open it 10 hours a day? Seven days a week. That, that's an option that would be out there. School-wise, we're open, you know, basically the librarian's in at 8, he's gone at 4. Both schools are too small for our school. We need more space. We need to expand what we're doing. Because we need more room for our, our therapy people that come in and work with us. We have three different therapy teams in our school system. And we have the clientele and the population in our mental health system to actually have four full-time teams. We've got kids that are put on waiting lists because of the scenarios that we go through. And we just prioritize and try and do the best we can. Okay, there's a question. Sir? Yes. I think we're all in the circle. Oh. Okay. I was just going to talk. Yes. Yeah. Uh, using your PowerPoint presentation, I think next meeting, I think you should come up with some specific uh, project numbers and project on cost of maintenance and operation. Because if, if it goes over what you budgeted for maintenance, then you're going to come back on the taxpayers again and say, we can't afford this, we need more money. I'll easily break that out. So I think it needs to be broken yeah. down. And, you know, what's it going to cost us for a janitor to clean all this? What's it going to cost us, you know, for swimming pool? Put the chemicals in there. I think it needs to be broken down piece by piece so we know what we're voting on. Yeah. Because right now all we're getting is <laughs> it might be this much, it might be sixty thousand for this. I think we need some definite facts because otherwise I think we're going to say no. The numbers that I've seen in it. Are hard numbers. The sixty thousand, it was sixty thousand two hundred was the exact total on you know their projections and their the engineers and electricians that come up. Probably the best way to answer that, um, Steve here is the CEO of the hospital. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, have you ever, at a board meeting that I've attended, told me we're gonna run a levy to operate a hospital, to build a hospital? So that's just, people are talking. People are talking, yeah. As the CEO, I know those that are in the, Steve and I just talked the other day, and that's the first question I asked again. I said, that keeps coming up that, are you going to run a levy? It's never been discussed at a board meeting. Um, they're looking at, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve and George through USDA loans, things on that level. Um, donations they are getting from locals to others, their campaigns that they're going forward. They're looking to fund that system themselves without a vote of the public. Right. Your children, they're missing. And we never have. Is The programming that we have is where we're expanding. What we do today is different than what was done 30 years ago or 20 years ago when this building was built. 
just the amount of programs that we bring into the school to try and help the kids has expanded. As an example, we've taken on a backpack program this year that sends food home on weekends with kids. What schools do is no longer the same as what they did 20 years ago. Just the mental health aspect, providing therapy space and areas for those people is an expansion of where we need to go. I would like, I would like you to ask a question. You would like me to ask a question? Yes. Would you ask this, Drew? Who's for this? Raise your hand. And who's against it? Who's for it? Who's against it? Who's undecided? Yeah, who's undecided? Yeah, who's undecided? Who's undecided? Who's undecided? Who's undecided? Who's undecided? I think as a community, you know, it's that decision we have to make. I think as a community, if we step forward and say, you know what, this is a good thing, go ahead. If as a community say, we want our hands off, then that's where the school district goes. But it also sends a signal to the, the city council members, regardless, pass or fail. If you say, yes, we want to pass this, City council members are going to say, for the past 10 years, we've spent X amount of year, dollars a year upkeep on the pool. That's what we need to project and look to contribute to this. If you say no, now we need as a city council to project, okay, can we reasonably look at a future of our pool? There's going to be a point in time, I mean, everyone keeps telling me, you've got a sinkhole under it, or these things are happening, you're losing X amount of gallons of water. There's a point in time the city has to shut it down. That's something the city council is going to learn from this vote, just as the school board is going to learn from this vote. I have a question. Um, this is not a question, it's a statement. I called the uh, the, hot, the library, and I asked if they had any plans at all. When they said library here, did that mean the superior library or the school library? They said absolutely not. Their board has discussed it. They have no intention of moving here, for at least three reasons. One is, they have a governing board. They do not want to come under the, the uh, authority of the other board. Um, they do not want to be in an area where there's uh, high humidity with the books. Secondly, a thirdly, this is my idea, I don't think they have the assets with which to move the books and bookshelves here. I believe at a school board meeting, when, asked, when Mike uh, Woods was asked, whether or not the town would be willing to donate their 40,000 budget on the pool towards this project, Mike said no. They had no intentions at that time. Those are two areas of supposed added income that, uh, not, this, not the uh, uh, town li uh, library, but that are not coming into this project at all. Okay, Mr. Jim, you know, I'll just say, it sort of reminds me, I, Trying to be convinced. Mm -hmm. Okay, this sort of reminds me of the extreme makeover. If you watch it on TV, oh yeah, they take one family and they build them a thing with all the facilities, everything. They could do that for ten families or twenty families. What they spend on one family. But well, we got a police department that cannot get police officers to the pay is too low. You can't get. Uh, they got enough money for that. You got so many other things besides just people's recreation and all that stuff to take into attention, you know, the swimming pools, everything's a good idea. But, and then I, the second thing, I'd like to know what percentage of Mineral County is going to pay this levy and what percent's not going to pay anything on the levy. <clears throat> what percentage of Mineral County would pay for this? It's just, as far as the school district, it's Superior School District. And a lot of the chatter that goes out on Facebook Ultimately, we are in the center of the county, and will we attract from the east as well as the west? We will attract, yes. The hospital and clinic has a bus that they're running routes to Alberton and to the west end and St. Regis. By all means, common sense says they're going to try and attract and, and use that facility to let people come in if they're exercising. How many in the county are voting on it? I don't know offhand. We've got about 1,600 
um, registered voters in the school district, and they tell me the population of the county is about 5,500, 5,200, right in there. So we're, you know, easily with kids and everything, we're 50% of the county. Okay. Uh, question back there. We're going to, uh, real quick, we're going to have to start wrapping this up. You guys have uh, got a lot of questions to ask. We're going to have another meeting. I'd like to have you there. If your questions aren't asked, please write them down. And remember, so when you come back here, you'll be able to get your questions asked. I'll try and get to you. If we're already pushing 830. Go ahead, sir. I come from Victor, Montana. And for the majority of my life, they fought to get a bond through just to remodel their high school and their facilities. Every time it got turned down. It took somebody like Wayne Stanley, a new superintendent, his name is Oprah Getz, and he came in and he spent a year looking at things as the principal. Next year he moved up as the superintendent and he was still filling things out. Well, he got with people like Scott Kenny and other people in the school system and in the community and he got asking ideas. What they came up with was to throw out the idea of a performing arts building. And with that performing arts building, they throw in, I think it was five to seven classrooms to try and get classrooms in there too. And they figured it was a wild shot. There were so many gifts and I don't know about that project, but they got it passed and it turned into a huge success. So if you want to check out, Victor's the same size as us and they're not incorporated. But they've been able to take an idea and turn it into this wonderful thing. And they're, they're moving along with it. They can throw movies there that they do two times a month that they charge. They have ballerina recitals. They have music recitals. And they're making money that they never even expected to make. And all of it came from what ifs. How can we make this work? and the community came together and they worked together. I have two small businesses. I'm concerned about the taxes going up, but I also have two small kids, and I am here to see to it that my children have a future. I help out with the community. I volunteer with the Cub Scouts in this small area, and I'm proud to do it. And if I need to volunteer, and I can volunteer for this community center, if it gets built, I'm willing to do it because this is my community. This is where I live and I'm proud of this area and I'm not going to let it die away without a fight. Thank you. Uh I think ultimately it, it comes down to our board members and every meeting I've been at with board members that talk we've had all along is that we're capping it at that. It's not something that you can push, push, push. We have to go in with the mentality, this is the maximum we're spending set up. That has been our goal from day one. Darren, you can, I mean, it's, we're taking a leap of faith one to come to the public. I mean, as a straw poll right now, how many of you would support a $7 million high school? 2.7 is what this building costs. Projections on building a new high school are about 13 million. So we can't, we can't go to a full high school. Statistically in Montana, outside of Bozeman and Helena and the, the larger cities, there's not a new building built. 
procuring capacity of the district to max the absolute dollar amount to try and build a facility isn't there. If you look at other states, how those states bought into what they're doing, they're trying to take their bonus money. Wyoming right now builds new schools. They're taking their coal and gas money, and that's their projection. We have basically four plans, A, B, C, D. Your population is this. The age of your building is this. That's the school we're putting in your community. That's how that state has addressed it. No one else has done that. No one else has gone to the public saying this is how we're investing into our schools. How's the funding going to come out from the legislature? George, you were a superintendent for a number of years. Any clue this time of year where it's going to go? No. About April, no clue. About May when they finally settle legislatively, that's when we know what we're operating on. Each year we go into negotiations with the teachers, making that same assumption that this is where our legislators are hopefully going to take us. We don't budget for it, we try and assume this is where they're going to go. Okay, George? Yeah, I'd like you to explain to I'm sure a lot of people don't understand grant. Okay, so, and we can keep an eye on school, we can keep an eye on school, we can keep an eye on school, because I have been around the grant situation. I'm confused. We get them from the federal government, is that correct? There's some are federal government. Okay. There's some right now we have a. Let me, let me finish. Just say, uh, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, 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 you answer part of my question. We have a sixteen trillion dollar deficit in this, in this in this country. We are borrowing money from China. I don't want two thousand dollars of China money in our town. Sorry. Mr. Wright. Yeah. So everybody can hear you, please. Well, I, I have one comment. It's going to be open 24 hours a day. I was going to say it's going to sell alcohol. My comment is the first time you have a wedding in there, the drunk with alcohol, the drunks are going to trash the place and they're going to try and break into the pool, no matter what you say. But, see, my question is the same one I had before, you see, because if you're saying this thing even needs a different board, you're just saying. It's not school work. It's something to do with it. It's like the most monstrous misappropriation of funds. The intent of having a separate board is because you have buy-in from other groups. But you don't have any buy-in. Or a senator. And you want to assure the people that, regardless of who your administrator is, that access is given. And having a separate operational board assures you that. It's not a case that someone can come in and say, you know what, I don't want the men's league in here at this hour. As taxpayers, you own this building. I don't. The only time I can realistically keep you out of this building is when I have kids in here and you're disrupting the educational process. Okay? That's the only time I can shut people down from interrupting the school day. Plain and simple. There's no other time in the day that I can say, you don't get access to the building. You can prove to me you're not disrupting the educational process. I have no legal right to hold you out here. You paid for the building. Correct? It's not the school's business. Okay. Uh, next, uh, we have two, just for two questions left, and then we're going to have to pass out. I've got Ron and I've got Mr. Have you considered the impact that a decrease in value on the businesses, buildings, etc., here are going to make on your levy? The decrease in tax or increase in tax hasn't been projected either direction. Uh, I guess I looked at it. If my valuation goes up fifty thousand, if we all go down fifty thousand, is that going to change? What changes is how much the county, the school district asks for in dollars. Regardless of the, the valuations, if we're a poorer district, if we're a poor tax base, the state formulas help fund it a little bit better. As far as the school district, they take over a larger percentage on the school funding. In this project, the state itself, OPI, would dedicate about 50,000 a year. 
is what they're funding and their payments, they would pay about a million dollars at the project based on where our economic status is now. So if our evaluation went down, OPI's funding actually comes up just on the equalizing factor. They have kind of a state balancing system. George, you can correct me. You probably, you help write up. That's what I'm thinking. What happens is the oil rich district pays a million dollars to this school for a deal on the project. Okay. Hi, it's Mr. Wilson. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jeff Wilson, and I'm, I'm chairman of the uh, library board for the county. And, and I'd just like to correct that uh, the library board has never taken a, 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 a position on whether or not to move in. We've had some discussions. Uh, some of the points that, that you brought up were part of our discussion. We've never taken a vote on, on whether or not we want to move into this facility or not. Uh, we're interested in work uh, in moving in with uh, Alberton, but we've never made a decision. Yet. No. And I've never been contacted as to no. what our position is. All right, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, I, I attended the meeting and visited with Jeff, and, and that's the point there is that financially, this isn't a make or break. They have the county buy into. We want to have that ability to say, if this facility is there, do you want to come into it? There's not a case of, well, you don't want to come in now, we're never going to let you in. Because that's thinking wrong. I mean, if we've got a facility where we're getting four or 5,000 people a month into, by all means, we want to have people there using it. Whether it's the library, the pool, the walking track, you want it to be used by a community. Mrs. Mellon, real quick. Let's do it here. Then we'll have to pay to get more to get into that facility. Myself, if we do do this, this is a good location. Let's not push it out. You know, it's right in the middle of the county on both sides. Let's not push it out. Let's look at it and look at it hard. Okay. I think the same thing has been stated all along. If you're going to allow alcohol in the right. facility, you're, you're going to have a set requirement right. that a liquor license be brought in, security be brought in. By no means are you trying to have access so that you can easily get into a pool facility or you can get into the gymnasium. If you've got a wedding dance going on, the last thing I want is three guys that have had a lot too much to drink to do a basketball game. The officials have a hard enough job, let alone doing something like that. Yeah, last question, Mr. LaPierre. I have more of a comment. Um, I've had lots of discussions with George and people around the And I'd just like to thank Mr. Stanley for having the vision to do this. Um, you know, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, he's been a visionary. Um, and I'd just like to thank you. questions that you don't feel that were answered maybe Mr. Stanley might be here for a few minutes afterwards. On the back of the flyer too if you want to email me or give me a call at the school or if you want me to come out to any group you've got you know give me a holler. We have next week uh, date and time please. 7 o'clock Wednesday night uh, 25th. Okay we'll be here please bring the questions. 23rd. 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 23rd is Wednesday? Yes. 23rd. Wednesday. Are you and sure? thank you again, please, please drive careful.